Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, as we approach February, we kind of wonder about the kind of chaos that we're seeing with this newly elected president, or is he? Well, what we're also going to discover is what is known as the global rise of nationalism. From Brexit to the popularity of Donald Trump, from Central Europe to Italy, and from India to Turkey, the world is moving to the nationalist populist right like never before. The question is why? Well, our guest will explain about the powerful trends behind this mass move to the populist right and how these dynamics are completely overturning the globalist political and economic order. Populations are reawakening to their cultures, customs, and traditions, and I'm sure that as you listen today, you'll feel encouraged to learn why this nationalist renewal is only just the beginning. On our program today is YouTuber Dr. Steve Turley. He's also speaker, scholar, as well as author of wonderful books, and we started listening to him and actually watching his channel. It was actually, I want to say, early last summer. And I'll tell you, it's something that most of you should take a look at because it's a very encouraging as well as a calming voice out there in the political world. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest, Dr. Steve Turley. Steve, thank you for being with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me. You know, one of the fun things I love about radio, especially when you do it long enough, is you start meeting and talking to people you just wouldn't expect. And it's very exciting to have you on the program. As I said, I started watching your stuff on YouTube. I think it was early last summer as we were all being closed in by the COVID. And I like that your voice was usually not only even and steady, it was positive, but it had a lot of reason behind what you were talking about. Tell us how your journey started with all this. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I actually was doing my doctorate research um, at Durham University, and in many ways it was sort of my, shall we say, Hogwarts moment. Durham is an old uh, medieval town in northern England, and they did actually film some of the Harry Potter there. And In fact, one of the professors that I studied with is an older Russian Orthodox priest with a long white beard and a black Cossack, so I even had my own Dumbledore there. And it, <laughs> it, was, it was really just a magical time of life when I would go on out there to work in their libraries, but I'd say it was probably oh, 2008 or nine. I came across a field of study known as post-secular studies. Uh, we might know it a little bit more commonly as sort of post-globalist studies in a way, a little bit more inclusive there. But the basic gist of post-secular studies was that the old sociological thesis that began at the beginning of the 20th century with Durkheim and Max and Weber and all, was that, uh, that the more technological, the more educated, the more prosperous societies become, then the more religious, they, I'm sorry, then the less religious they would, they would be. And so Europe had seemed to be sort of the fulfillment of that thesis. Uh, and then you had the fall of the Soviet Union, and all of a sudden, particularly in Eastern Europe, Eastern Orthodoxy comes back with a bang. As a matter of fact, today, the Russian Orthodox Church enjoys a prominence not seen since the days of the czars. So a lot of scholars have had to say, wait a minute now, something's not right. And of course, that was all precipitated by things like the, uh, the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1979 and the rise of uh, the Christian conservative activists uh, in the 1980s, moral majority, uh, you know, a Christian coalition. And so they had, to, scholars had to rethink the role of secularism and religion and how they interrelate in a burgeoning modern society. And more, more scholars came to the conclusion that it's actually the modern world that's actually beginning to fade out. And a new postmodern world that was opening up space once again for older civilizational religious traditions and customs and cultures and nationhood and the like um, that, uh, that is, uh, that's the wave of the 21st century and beyond. And I, I have to say, I didn't really believe it at first when I read, it. I was pretty skeptical. I, I mean, I saw sure Middle East, sure, you know, India, sure, Russia, Africa, but you know, America uh, and Canada and Western Europe, give me a break. 
But then I'll never forget, you know, June, June 23rd, uh, 2016, and uh, we all woke up. Actually, it was the 24th when we woke up. Brexit happened, and the, and the European Union started to shrink for the very first time. And then a few months later, the Trump victory on November 8th of 2016. And then all of a sudden, I just started to see a world that these post-scholar, these post-secular scholars uh, we're predicting, and that is a world that was going to move away from these kind of scientifically rationalist, one-size-fits-all, political, economic, technological structures, and they're going to move much more to nation, culture, custom, tradition, particularly their religious uh, traditions. And so I said, I got to share the scholarship with people. This is too much, too much fun and too exciting to just hold to my to myself. Exciting in many ways, by the way, both uh, in terms of things I would be very happy about as a confessing Orthodox Christian, but also, it, you know, uh, humans never fail to disappoint. So a post-secular society is going to bring in a whole new set of challenges as well. And I, I try my channel, I think, uh, tries to be faithful to both. You know, and for people who aren't familiar with your work, when you go to your YouTube channel, you're really balanced about the different things that you cover that I might say, well, you know, it's a political voice, but at the same time, you'll also see it's a cultural voice. It's, as we were talking about in the opening, you know, the nationalist voice, that sort of a thing there. And it's really... Uh, <laughs> When Trump was running for re-election, it was funny how there were people that I knew that said, oh, I didn't know you were going to vote for Trump. And I said, well, it's not really Trump that I'm voting for, although, you know, I, I get a kick out of the guy. I have since he was, you know, back in the 80s when you had the art of the deal, and then you go further on, then eventually he's got the number one award-winning show, The Apprentice, which was funny because NBC's threatening to fire Trump off of his show. And I'm like, yeah, good luck with that. You don't even have <laughs> right. ratings as it is. You think, And it didn't happen, of course. And I, and I was right on the money about that. But when he was running for president, it was sort of like they thought I was a Republican. I said, no, Trump doesn't represent Republicans. He just That's has right. to run on that ticket. Now, I'm someone, I haven't done this show for about 18 years now, is that we, we've kind of like skipped along on the political spectrum but when we would hit certain guests, they would be really eye-opening for me to do further research. And I remember one of the most eye-opening ones for me is when we had, um, I'm trying to remember, John Perkins, the economic hitman. Mm -hmm. And then I started going, okay, when I was reading in his books, I was like, well, I remember hearing about that back in the 70s, so what's really going on here? So what you just explained is actually, you know, when you think about the scientific approach to being able to, let's say, socially engineer humans, this is something that goes back to like just before the 1900s. Mm -hmm. That this was a belief in what is now known as the deep state right. that we're actually moving toward globalism. And so, as you look into this, you know, and you hear about this new green deal, it's like. No, look, you idiots, this new Green Deal's been going on for almost 100 years now. They just finally found a window they think they're going to win in, and I don't think that's going to happen. And that's where nationalism has risen, because I think underneath it all, we inherently know there's something wrong here. Yeah, yeah, well put. There is a, there is a massive backlash. And, and again, I love how you put it, too, the whole notion of, well, I didn't know you were a Republican, you know, voting for Trump. Well, I'm not. <laughs> he, he brought in a lot of Democrats and independents, and that's because the new trend is to move away from the old 20th century politics, which was generally an ideologically based politics. You know, I think about the Cold War context. You know, are you a capitalist or are you a communist? Are you a Democrat or are you a Republican? Are you, are you on the left or are you the right? Uh, the 20th century was the age of ideology. I mean, we fought, you know, uh, major wars around that, particularly the Second World War with fascism versus communism versus, uh, you know, Western globalist, uh, you know, uh, democracy and the like. What you're seeing now is a move away from a politics of ideology to a politics of identity. Now, we tend to think of identity politics as solely on the left with cultural Marxism and the like, but actually that's a subcategory. It's, it's a subcategory to a, a major shift in our politics where it's not so much about what you believe and whether you're ideologically pure. It's more like, who are you and, and to what do you belong? Do you, what, what kind of culture, custom, tradition, inheritance 
do you belong? We hear a lot about things like white privilege, for example. But for, I was talking to a fellow from Hungary, uh, Viktor Orban, being one of the major uh, world leaders in this nationalist populist uprising. And this fellow from Hungary looked at me and said, I hear you guys talking about uh, white privilege all the time. You know, in Hungary, we simply call it inheritance. <laughs> you know, and I thought, well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a real neat way of yeah. you know, recasting that. Sure. And yeah, and so what, what we're seeing as a result of that, of this move to identity, which certainly does move, work itself out in, uh, on the left, in terms of uh, identity politics, but identity politics don't have a lot to do with nation, right, or, or anything like that, so national borders, if, if anything. Identity politics don't like borders. Uh, the other side of identity politics, which you tend to see on the right, again, for lack of a better term, is, is more of a nationalism, and what I like to call the new nationalism, very different than the kind of imperialist, modernist nationalism that we saw in the 20th century. No, this is, this is a very different kind of nationalism. It's really a nationalism of return. It's wanting to go back. Actually, it's actually, it, it wants to get rid of any imperialist shred, uh, uh, you know, any imperialist sense or sentiment whatsoever, and just go back to a sense of border security and economic security and cultural security. And then what that's doing is it's opening up a different politics. And instead of having the animosity of left versus right, or, or the ideological, you know, capitalist versus communist or whatever it is, now it tends to be more the people versus the political class, the people who are, are part, going back to nation, culture, custom, and tradition, and a political class that really like the 20th century globalist politics and continue to try to export them in the form of globalism. And so whether it's political globalism, economic corporate globalism, media globalism, whatever it is, it's always, always, always a one-size-fits-all political and economic system that superimposes itself on all peoples, all times, all places. And if you're not a globalist, then by definition, you are a legitimate object of scorn. You, you Globalists see themselves as being scientifically rational and liberal, and therefore anyone who is anti-globalist, by definition, has to be irrational and repressive, and therefore, you know, a legitimate object to be scorned is deplorable. And so that all that's doing is creating more deplorables. It's creating more of a divide between the people and the political class, the permanent political class. So it's not, it's not Democrat versus Republican per se. That's certainly how our nation might be working it out. But I mean, the left has its Bernie's, it has its uh, uh, AOC's, it has its populist movement. In many ways, the BLM's and the Antifa's, they're just as much at war with the old bougie center left, you know, neoliberal as they would be, say, with, with Trump. So it's a fascinating shift away from an ideologically based politics to much more of an identity based politics. And the identity-based politics that's really coming to the fore now is it is the people versus the political class. It's the values, the interests and concerns of localities, of communities, uh, of a sense of nation versus the values and interests and concerns of a much more bougie sort of political class. And that's, that I think you're going to see as pretty much the permanent political antagonism uh, for the foreseeable future. I was thinking, and I've been thinking a lot actually over the last year of this wonderful book out there written by Roy Williams, who's also known as the Wizard of Ads out of Texas. And he co-wrote a book, I can't remember the other author's name, it's called The Pendulum. And what he talks about is there are two cycles that tend to occur in human history that usually last about 40 years. It's a we cycle. And then there's the me cycle. Mm. Now, it's really fascinating because he goes way back in human history to, sh- to show you what this looks like. Now, here's, here's, a, here's a wild one for you. Now, we're moving out of the we cycle. Okay, It's on its final downward swing, and we'll be moving into the me cycle in 2023. Now, typically when the we cycle is on its way out in its last 10 years, 
which he hear is a lot of kicking and screaming and scratching because they don't want it to end. You mm. know, it's the we're all in this together. If you look at the COVID deal, the whole message in the beginning of it is we're all in this together. And look at all the kicking and screaming and scratching that's been happening in this last election cycle. Now, I couldn't help it, but when you look back in this pendulum timeline that he has in there, one of them was during Caesar's reign back in Rome. Okay. Oh wow! He, he goes betrayed. all the way. Yeah, yeah. He was betrayed by Brutus, and he was murdered because he was trying to lead a populist movement, much like what we're seeing today with Trump. Right. And I thought this is weird <laughs> because right. he's, he's he's showing with pretty great accuracy. And he says to give you an example of what it's like when the me movement went on its downward swing, which was in the 1980s, and it ended in 1993. You had songs like, for instance, in the me movement, we become more glorified in the romantic way we've seen our past. Songs like Glory Days from Bruce Springsteen, you know, and, and things like that. And so my wife and I, we've been talking about this book for the last couple of years. And I said, as we're watching what's happening, we're like, you know, he's pretty much on the money about this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because yeah, he went like way a, back a in history. Turning. Yeah, it is. So we're moving into a me cycle and the, the populist movement, and you're starting to hear the language of it because he also outlines the kinds of things people talk about in each of these two swings, you know, and again, so it'll be a 20-year upward swing, and then it'll be a 20-year downward swing, and we'll be back into the we movement again. Right, right. And the language and the way that we define and look and experience things during these times are uniquely different, but then again, they're kind of the same because we are people. What are your thoughts about something like that? Yeah, well, I, I got to say, I dig, it's technically known as cyclical theory, and there's a lot of different schools in there, and I got to say, I dig it. I mean, it's, it's a, um, you know, it's a meta theory, so it's going to be a theory that's going to be able sure. to, to explain a, a lot of micro uh, data. Yeah, he's not alone. There, like I said, um, there is that, uh, there's the, uh, the fourth political turning, it's that uh, Neil Howe and that makes a very similar argument uh, generationally uh, that you can you can basically trace out a pattern. Uh, he he focuses particularly on American history, um, but uh, but I, I, it's applied to global history as well. There's also uh, Rudolf Sorkin uh, and his notion of an ideational society, an idealistic society, and then a sensate basically falls apart. And, um, and when, you know, it falls into sin, it falls into all this debauchery, but then it always goes back to some kind of you know, uh, ideational uh, structure, because it's almost like somebody going on a drunken binge, you know, and, <laughs> you know, in college for, for four years, and right. then you, they just say, man, I've got to get my life together, you know, and it's <laughs> society. Not to mention, kind of, I've got student loans, that was an expensive drunk binge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, society basically does that. The Indians uh, have uh, this notion of Kali Yuga. You might have heard of uh, in Hinduism, Kali Yuga is like the last of these four cosmic stages. Right. Yeah. Right. And Very it's familiar. it's a, it, yeah, it's an age of sin. It's an age of just debauchery and everything's falling apart. And but it's well, always followed by Satya Yuga, which uh, which they believe they're going through right now with what's called the BJP, the Bharatiya Janata Party, which is a thoroughly Hindu nationalist party. So really, their very first Hindu nationalist party they've ever had as an independent nation up to that point i think they were brought in around 2014 uh virtually every indian uh mp member of parliament was educated in britain they would have been educated right where i was and you know like durham university and so in many ways the, the indians felt uh that they were they were having sort of this western again kind of one size fits all globalist government sort of forced down their throats and then when the uh, people like Narendra Modi, who's their prime minister, very, very friendly to Trump, very similar to Trump, um, actually, uh, he came out and said, you know, these politicians are, are selling our future down the river and they don't care anything about our customs and our cultures and our history and our inheritance. We're a Hindu people and it gives us meaning and purpose. Boom, he wins this massive landslide victory in 2014, did it again in 2019, and, um, you know, that's the first time that's happened, those two back-to-back -back landslide. As a matter of fact, the BJP, a little fun fact here, not only are they the biggest Democratic 
party on the planet, which is a thoroughly Hindu nationalist party, but they also won the single biggest uh, landslide democratic victory in democratic politics in any kind of democracy. So it is interesting because a lot of, you know, our listeners are thinking, oh, the world's just falling apart and everything's terrible and it woe is us. And well, no, if you, if you love good, you know, good old fashioned sort of conservative nationalist populism, localism and the like, actually, believe it or not, that's winning all over the place. We may, we may have hit a bit of a snag here, but you look around the world, and if anything, scholars are going, my, the days of the center-left, center-right kind of mainstream globalist politics, the neo-lib, neo-con, those days are dead. They're over. Again, it just might take some time to play itself out here, but you go around the world, and I mean, uh, many ways, you know, in Israel, the yeah, Labor Party gave us some of the, the most prominent and famous prime ministers uh, in the world, you know, Ehud Barak and, you know, uh, uh, Rabin and all that sort of stuff. In the last several elections in Israel, labor can't even break 10%. Wow. <laughs> they, they can't even break double digits. It, 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 there's just been a total collapse of the center left. They've got the blue and white party, a brand new party right now. So third parties are popping up all over the place. So whenever you hear the talk of Patriot Party, that's again, that's just a trend going on all over. So yeah, I I mean it's uh, and then and then Israel's going further further right because you have all these ultra orthodox parties starting because Haredi Jews are the ones that are having all the children. <laughs> so right. like, so right. demographics is destiny, and so we're seeing the same thing with the Amish or conservative Mormons or you name it here. So anyway, there's lots of trends going on. So yeah, I think there's something to cyclical theory. There's there's definitely these larger trends that are going on that we can use to help us better understand uh, what's going on 24-7, as it were. Now, here's another way we can also look at this, too. Uh, as I tell people, if you really want to study history, study the motivation behind why things happen, especially when you put money in it. And uh, we had a guest on the program some time ago, Susan Bradford, that really loves to study about the crown and British royalty and so forth. And then you get into certain other people <clears throat> who actually like to look into things like the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and so forth and how the banking system created the kind of world influence that we see and are experiencing today. And the idea that, well, they like to create wars, so they've got both sides that they're actually funding, and then they put these people into debt. Now, when you start talking about the United States and how we came to be settled, if you will, uh, you're starting to hear a lot of talk, which you didn't hear about this five years or ten years ago, let's say in main conversations about the United States, for instance, being a corporation under the Queen's rule or under British rule. And I said, I don't know that that's any different than the Chinese CCP that maybe the British said instead of going out and physically conquering nations and taking them over like they did back in the day, they found a way to kind of creep in and, and defeat them through their politics and their people. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I have to say, well, I think the corporation idea, is that the 1871 Act? Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, new, the new constitution that they enacted versus the organic one, of course. Right, right. Yeah, it's interesting. I... Unfortunately, I ha I've been asked this before, and I really got to do my due diligence there and do my study. Yeah, I have not, really is a, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I've just mm -hmm. not, I've not studied enough to really have um, a, a, any opinion on it to, to, uh, that would be responsible. Certainly, when you bring up the CCP, though, my, they have their Belt and Road Initiative, and, um, and, and that's, in effect, creating vassal states, and that is happening. And it is very concerning the extent to which uh, many of our um, globalist elite uh, in Washington, D.C., and in L.A. and Silicon Valley seem to have absolutely no problem with that whatsoever. Uh, so, and Seems if they really think, is. by the way, if they think they're going to have it simple with that, you know, I've got two words for you. You're the Jack Ma, you know. You can, right. you, you can disappear real quick. I mean, um, I like Olavo de Carvalho, the Brazilian uh, philosopher's uh, philo theory that we actually have three globalisms today. That helps me to kind of make some sense of things. 
So we've got your Western globalism, you know, it centers on in Brussels and, and Silicon Valley and D.C. and all. And then he says you actually have your what he would basically call it kind of your Leninist uh, globalism, uh, which centers in Beijing. So our globalism, as you pointed out, is primarily a bank-oriented, economic-oriented globalism, where the CCP is going to be much more of a state-oriented uh, globalism. And so uh, the that way our policy... That how you're putting all this, too. Actually. Yeah, well, I wish it was mine. <laughs> it's a lot of the uh, who, I've, who, inter- yeah. I've, in- I've interviewed him. He's, he's fantastic. He's considered the intellectual force behind... Jair Bolsonaro, who won the 2018 uh, presidential election in Brazil and is known as the Tropical Trump. So, again, it, I it's would all... love if you could, Steve, if you could maybe shoot me an email for this, because, see, th- you're talking about something that's really unique, and it's I like to take the 30,000-foot view of things. Yeah. Now, there are people that will go out, and they'll hear something, and like a dog with a stake, they'll take and they'll run with it, and what do I like to say? Go down the rabbit hole. Right. Well, then all you're doing is you're proving the biases you were looking for anyway, much like what globalism and the scientific view of social engineering is. You know, right. I don't see any science there. <laughs> right. Especially right. the COVID should loudly and clearly Ooh. scream, there is no science here. <laughs> right, but right. that being said, what I like to do is grab pieces of information, kind of file it away until something comes along and triggers it that makes me look that direction, and it creates an interesting journey or a web if you will, where you get to have that 30,000-foot view and go, oh, I see this much clearer now than somebody who's just, boom, trying to be red-pilled or whatever the case may be. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, you're looking for, a, right, you're looking for a theory that can put together the pieces. I mean, that's what every physicist is trying to do. You know, you have your, your, your theory, the mathematical theory, but it's got to fit the, the, the material data and and when you have a uh, when the the hand fits the glove you know you've got this perfect lineup then you've got something that really is reflective reality yeah and just to, and to work it all the way through and then he sees a third globalism that's islam and he sees that as in his uh, you know a religious globalism in islam so you've got a an economic globalism you've got a status globalism and you have a religious globalism and they're they're kind of a clash and if you think about it that's exactly what trump was doing he was fighting all three if you think it through, so, you know, he's pretty hard on Iran because Iran is really at the center of the Islamic globalism. He is r- radically hard on China, and he's radically hard on Silicon Valley and Brussels and Washington, D.C. So he wasn't just taking on one globalism in many ways. He was taking on three. Now, now that you bring it up that way, here's something to throw in there. Now, the original trifecta of globalism, as I've come to understand it, was the city of London, which was the banking, that it was the Vatican as the center of religion, and the United States as the center of military power. Mm. So now you see this transformation that you're talking about of free globalism just kind of maybe wearing different clothes. Is that kind of a way we can look at it? I think so. That's a neat, I, I'm not familiar with that, that triangle. Uh, but yes, yeah. So we've got our own, as it were, and it has a, a, a threefold kind of outworking. And, uh, and then that's getting duplicated in its different ways in, in the sort of, as it were, the three major civilizational centers of the world. Again, it's just a nice, it's a nice handy way of trying to make some sense of, of, you know, the 24-7 craziness. The biggest, biggest thing we want to avoid is getting that myopic view of just seeing, you know, the, just knowing everything about the last 24 hours, not much about the last, you know, 24 days, and next to nothing about the last 24 right. years. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think Trump was really or has been working toward achieving here when you take a look at this nationalist movement and, and you had just talked about it, but what do you think that goal really was? I definitely think it was a, an attempt to restore civic nationalism as the, um, the, the centripetal force that keeps us together. I, I, the, the fundamental question of the 21st century is going to be whether or not our nations can hold together. Um, if the modern world has ended and we're moving into a postmodern world, so the modern world rooted in the 18th century Enlightenment, um, that believe that scientific rationalism was the one true way of understanding reality, and therefore we can now have a universal international harmony, political, economic, 
harmony rooted in a one-size-fits-all scientific rationalism. If that world has died, which it has in the hearts and minds of people at least, then it's moving into a a post-secular world where we're breaking up, we're balkanizing as a world. So as I understood, I talked to Dan Miller, oh, when was that, a a week ago or so? Dan Miller is the president of Texas, actually. He's been the president of the Texas nationalist movement now for, oh my, I think about 20 years or so. And a great guy, really neat, very bright, very smart, very measured but he, you know, he takes inspiration from Brexit and Nigel Farage and so forth and says, hey, Texas should be its own uh, republic, sovereign republic. Washington, D.C. is broken. It can't be fixed. And, you know, it's time for us to, uh, to secede. And I'm very fascinated by those secessionist movements because, as he was pointing out, I think it was around World War II, there were only about 45 or 50 uh, actual nations um, in uh, in the world. So you still had a lot of imperialism operative back then. And mm. then uh, now you have 190 or so nations in the world, right? Uh, give or take, right? And I pointed out to him, yeah, and over 35 of those have come ever, just since the fall of the Soviet Union. What you're noticing we're breaking up. And the question then is whether or not nations, especially ones that have been forged during the modern period, right, like the United States, right, in the, the, the end of the uh, 18th century, during that period, are we going to be able to hold together or are we going to balkanize as well? And I think Trump said, yeah, we're going to hold together and we're going to hold together by celebrating our nation's cultures, customs, and traditions, rather than denigrating them in this politically correct way. We're going to protect our borders. We're going to bring our manufacturing jobs back home. And we're going to create, you know, a, a, a America first MAGA movement that's going to galvanize the vast majority of the American people, which I believe it has. And, and polls show that. Even, even Biden had to campaign on kind of an America first agenda in terms of manufacturing, like even though he's selling us down the river, but <laughs> nevertheless, he had, right, he had to at least campaign that way. Right. And so I think Trump recognizes it's either civic nationalism or it breaks up into kind of micro-nationalisms. That's what I think BLM is. That's what I think La Raza is. That's what I think the tensions are in Quebec, in Catalonia, in Scotland, I mean, we could look all over the place, the world's breaking up. And the only thing that's going to hold us together is a kind of civic nationalism. You know, 90% of the nations in our, uh, in our world today are ethno-pluralists. So there are going to be multiple, lots of different ethnicities, lots of different cultures and customs. But they're all united under sort of a single banner of, say, Russianness, for example. So Russia has over 100 different ethnicities. In it, um, or uh, under a single banner of, you know, uh, being, um, you know, British and, and, or whatever, or Canadian or whatever happens to be. And the only way that holds together is, ironically, if we have a nationalism, if we have right. some kind of sense that we're part of a common destiny, we're part of a common history, we're part of a common cause. You, the moment you break that all up under these globalist guys, uh, they, they wipe away all the borders, everything becomes transnational, nation doesn't matter, and so forth. Then you have the backlash, but if the backlash isn't a renewed civic nationalism like Trump was arguing for, inevitably it starts breaking up. I don't see any way around that. And so that's, that's what I think he was really trying to do, he was trying to bring us together, hold us together with civic nationalism and push globalists out as, um, you know, literally, I mean, when he would talk about the globalist media, he'd say, you know, you're the enemy of the, notice what he would say, the American people. You're, you're an enemy of one people, one destiny, one nation. And, uh, and we'll have to see. Hopefully we can get back to it. I'm not, I don't have a lot of confidence. Like you, I don't have a lot of confidence in the GOP. They really seem to be about as... Uh, Oh my, as feckless as it, anyone. I don't, I don't know if Kevin McCarthy, if he, he, I don't think he's figured out whether he needs to impress the New York Times or impress the deplorables. He's still trying to work that one out. But. 
Well, well and the funny thing is, is the solution to all of this for any of these people, first of all, you decided to serve in government to serve the people. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Exactly. exactly. That's changed over the last, well, I'm going to go back, say, 100 years anyway. <laughs> I mean, right. you could go back and see the patterns, and there have been very few... Reagan, I'm still on the fence with, but you know he didn't. He did some great things, but right. after that, you could really see. Actually, it started with Jimmy Carter, as I right. understand. He was this peanut farmer that they actually handpicked to kick off the globalism that we're seeing today. Right. Uh, which because uh, this whole thing, this whole idea of globalism and the New Green Deal and all that, almost died, and the spirit was on its way to heaven until David Rockefeller got wind from one Brzezowski who came in and said, hey, this is this really great idea that I'm saying, oh, really? Okay, well, I just see a bunch of money in it, so yeah, let's go with it. So right. you look at, and uh, my wife had showed me a fascinating photo that shows Jimmy Carter, President H.W. Bush, President George W. Bush, and President Barack Obama, and Bill Clinton all together. Yeah, yeah. There's your sure. globalists. So see, yeah. you've got Republicans and Democrats, and they're alike now, there was a time I was seeing the what you would call the Republican agenda, and this was around H.W. and then G.W.'s time, right. where you were realizing these guys were looking for dominance and control through a police state. Right. And then the Democrats step in and they break all that up, but basically it was all the same thing. And I right. was like, okay, right. there's something kind of fishy going on here when you're changing parties, but somehow – in an underlying way, you can see the goal was the same, and now yeah. we see it like a pimple right now. It's come to a head. <laughs> yeah, it's a du- yeah, it's a duopoly, as I've heard it put. And I, I, I've noticed that. Uh, Douglas Mur- Murray, the uh, wonderful uh, uh, cultural critic, he just uh, wrote the book Madness of Crowds. And that's what he, he pointed out that what made Donald Trump so utterly unique is really for the first time he had – a, a very bold alternative agenda for the nation. So I, I think you got it right. I mean, they, they, they can argue, the two parties will argue, you know, one will say let's raise taxes by 5%. The other one says let's lower it by 5%. You know, one right. says let's, <laughs> let's, right, let's, let's, uh, let's increase regulations by such amount. The other one says no, let's decrease by such amount. But in the end, it's just a bunch of kids, you know, arguing in the same sandbox. I mean, Trump, in the end, was the one who came out and said, no, we're going to have a different, uh, a whole different paradigm. And that paradigm is going to be economic nationalism. It's going to be a nationalist populism. It's going to be a politics of the people. Uh, you're, you're very astute there in the sense that populists recognize that the political class operates by a fundamentally different politics. They actually, scholars call it, par- they call it pragmatic politics. And the pragmatic politics is working out the values, interests, and concerns of, of our elite class, which are so far removed from the values, interests, and concerns of the people. It almost looks like kabuki theater, you know, when you look right. at CNN and so forth. What made Trump so neat is for the first time, for the first time when people said, you know, we really would like to have a border wall, they didn't hear, well, that's just because you're a nativist and, and racist and bigots. For the first time, they heard somebody come out and say, okay, well, how high? Or if they said, you know, we really want to bring our manufacturing industrial jobs back home, we don't think it's a good idea that, you know, Beijing is in charge of all our pharmaceuticals, for example. And Trump looks at them and says, and he doesn't lecture him like Ben Sass would. I don't mind calling out that name. He really upsets me. He doesn't lecture him like Ben Sass. Well, I'm sorry, we're living in a different economy now, and you're just going to have to get used to that. No, Trump turns around and says, yeah, why don't we be energy independent, too? <laughs> you know, let's, let's not be dependent on the Middle East for, for oil and gas anymore. And, you know, people say, you know, we really, really like it if you could celebrate our, our customs and our traditions and, and honor the sanctity of life and all that sort of stuff. He said, no problem. I'll, I'll, how's Amy Coney Barrett? Does that sound good? You know, I mean, he, 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 he was never wimpy. He, was, he always was bold and brash and, and just like, you know, in The Apprentice. I mean, he just brought that to the politics. And we started to see pragmatic politics fall apart. And we started to see what scholars would call redemptive politics. And that's, that's the politics of the people. The concerns, the values, the interests of the people are suddenly being championed by our political 
uh, are politicians. And all of a sudden, the gap that used to exist between the people and the political class disappears, and we feel like we can be a part of a, one nation again. We feel this really is a nation of the people, by the people, for the people. And that's the magic of Trump. That's the magic of nationalist populism that's going on all over the world. Yeah, and I couldn't agree with you more. Again, as I was questioned about why I was voting for Trump, and I said it has nothing to do with Republican, none of that. Do you know what this election is really about? It would scare the hell out of you. And it should, because we have become complacent as a society in such a way that we don't feel we could do anything about what's happening. And we've been pretty much lulled asleep to believe that this is true. When you take a look at Wall Street, for instance, and the fact that maybe you can get in as a retail broker and maybe you can be a trader and make some money doing it, that sort of a thing, then that's possible. But the truth is that system gets rigged against you. And you take a look at all this, and I'll tell you, I've been meditating on the fact for this last week to two weeks about Trump himself and why I get a kick out of this guy. And I, and I want to shoot this out to anybody who may be a Generation X or a millennial, Generation Z. Let's stop whining and let's take a look at Trump for a minute and what he has endured the last four years. Mm. This guy, more than anybody I have ever seen in my presidential history, and I go back as far as Nixon at least, this guy has taken slings and arrows, he's taken nuclear bombs, he's taken anything you can throw at him, and what does he do? He faces it and he moves forward and focuses on the goal. Wow. And what everybody should be paying attention to is, if you want anything in life, this is exactly the kind of person you need to be, unapologetic for what you're doing knowing that you're trying to do the right thing through truth and getting there regardless of what's in your way. And so I'm reminded of that neat uh, scene in, that, uh, in Rocky Balboa where he gets on his son and he says, well, you go out there and you get what you're worth, but you've got to be willing to take the hits. Yeah. Because nobody's going to hit you harder than life, and that is absolutely true. But the question is, it isn't how hard you get hit. It's whether you can get hit, get back up, and continue forward. And everybody, and I, especially to the younger generation, pay attention to what Donald Trump just did in the last four years. And if you follow that model, there shouldn't be anything in life you couldn't have and achieve. And you'll get to a level where you'll come to understand a man who loves to give. Oh my! Oh, Dandy, that was beautiful. I'm gonna. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I, I've been meditating I'm gonna, on. The I'm last gonna have week. to take that, uh, splice that out of this interview, and just uh, just listen to that a few times. You got remember, I'm in the Philly area, so when you whenever you bring up Rocky, my eyes all of a sudden moist up, and I I love it. I love all. Of, I even I'm such a Rocky fan. I even love Rocky Five. Darn it. Okay. Yeah, hey, who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> I love, but I did love Rocky Balboa too. Yeah. Our default Rocky too. Six. I Brought sure did. Back. You know, it's fascinating. Just a quick little side note. I know we're up on the nationalism and all that, but uh, really, I was watching uh, uh, the original Rocky, and they had Sylvester Stallone doing the commentary in the background, as you can, you know, do those extra audio. Things. Yeah, yeah. And he was describing, believe it or not, that uh, Paramount was actually about to fire him off of his own story. Wow. <clears throat> and and wow. he and he literally said this. He says. You know, they were coming, they were about ready to let me go. And he says, basically, they just said, somehow you're just not working, and this is the character. And he right. says, you know, he totally says, I understand. Right. And he says, but here was the scene that changed everything. And it was the scene in the beginning of the movie when he's going to do collection, yeah. okay, from the guy on the forklift. And he knows he's going to take a beating because this guy doesn't have the money to pay right. You know, the, the, the book or whatever. He's supposed to break his thumbs. That's it's what Gaza to, wanted. Yeah, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. And then you get to the scene where he has to go to Gazo yeah. and he has to tell him, I think he's good for it next week. He says, that whole scene right there, Paramount said, no, you're the only man who can play this part. That was wow. the whole scene that changed everything. And, and to me, you know, Rocky, much, you know, Sylvester Stallone, to me, 
is a lot like Trump when you think about yeah. his career. And yeah. I and I and quote me anybody if I'm wrong, but I still think he is the most successful movie franchiser in movie history. Yeah. When you think yeah. of the franchise, you got Rambo, you got Rocky, now the Expendables, and yep. they're all entertaining and they're a good time. And he says, I just decided to stick with what I'm good at. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, he, he found his niche and he just he just hammered it home. And I remember he got. Uh, an award, I forget which one it was, but he just, you know, um, he he said uh, something like, you know, and I, I want to dedicate this ultimately to to Rocky because he's he's the best pretend friend I've ever had, or the best, you know, <laughs> invisible friend I've ever had. He sees Rocky as his, you know, we all have our our alter egos or whatever you call them. You know, we're growing up. That was it, Rocky was his and. And it's almost like it's just an angel that's followed him around all his life, and and he's blessed so many lives as a result. It's just your 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 wonderful life lesson there, right? It doesn't matter how hard you hit; it's how hard you get hit, and you got to keep moving forward. Absolutely. And there you go, Donald Trump. He's been eaten alive by the world media, <laughs> by everybody. That's right. And what does he do? He kept going forward. He was building the wall. He was trying to get jobs back here through manufacturing, which. Here's, here's something for you. I was actually out at a restaurant, and I ended up talking to somebody who actually was from Pennsylvania. And years ago, back in the 80s, my dad actually ran a, a screw machine shop, a manufacturing company, you know, that's on steel. So because I knew that industry well enough, when this guy volunteered and said, man, we love Trump in Pennsylvania, I'm like, oh, so I knew a couple of other people to call, like up in Michigan, Ohio, and so forth. How are you guys doing up there with, you know, steel production and so forth? And they said, you know, since Trump's been in office, it's been amazing. And I haven't right. heard that since the 80s, because even my right. dad had said, you know, by the late 80s, he says, manufacturing's dead here in the U.S. Right. Now, right. who better to know the center of that than he would? So I'm like, then how come we're not hearing about this in the news during the Trump administration? Like, but I'm hearing it from the actual people in the industry, so I knew there was a lot to it. Right. You know, sort of thing. Now, getting back to the Rocky scenario, the idea of the little guy getting the big shot, well, it seems to me with this whole thing with GameStop, it looks like Rocky was in there beating the hell out of Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> was that not amazing? Absolutely. Absolutely. That, and again, that's part of it. It's all part of it. It's all the same populist uprising, in this case, you know, against Wall Street and the 2008 bailouts. We saw the exact same thing going on here. Hedge funds getting bailed out, uh, you know, ex post facto rules being put in force. So saying, up, oh, you're not allowed to do what we've been doing now, of course, for 20 years and in knocking down these smaller businesses and the like through short selling. And absolutely it was. It was beautiful to watch. And it's uh, it's I don't know. It's difficult for me to see. I, I did see a couple of, you know, very very ideologically conservative personalities try to defend uh, the hedge funds, but I, I, you know, forget it. That's just that's 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 the twentieth century ideological approach. Today there is a sense of who do you identify with more? These these multi billion dollar hedge funds that that knock down the little guy all the time, or the little guys, the amateurs rising up and saying, hey, we're going to stick it to the hedge funds here. And play this game right so everybody can win rather than just you exactly. guys. Exactly. And exactly. it reminds me, too, of Rocky IV. You know, once he hit, what was it, Ig Egan Dra Dragoff, I can't remember. Drago, yeah. Drago, yeah. Once he hits him and cuts him, yep. you know, his trainer says, see, he's just a man. Yeah, <laughs> now yeah, stick it there with man. his butt. <laughs> that's it. Now go right. Go take him out. Exactly. Exactly right. Yeah. No, that's a good. I mean, right. Oh man, we we can get into Rocky. It's a Christmas we sure movie, could. if you remember. <laughs> yeah. And it's one of my favorite Christmas movies. Yeah. I push that because yeah, he he defeats the dragon basically, uh -huh. right? You know, yeah. it's it's really cool. Yeah. I know it's funny to think about Rocky too because I remember the movie that I went out to see that summer when Rocky was out was Jaws. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, so I poked into the, yeah, and I poked into another theater, and you could hear the Rocky music playing. I'm looking and going, oh, what's, oh, that's Rocky. And so he was running on the railroad tracks. It was the end training scene before the fight. But yeah. I hadn't even seen the movie. It wasn't until two or three years after it came out on television. Yeah. You know, but Jaws. So I was actually really maybe watching what's happening now. The globalism. The Jaws. <laughs> they're just eating us alive. 
no. yeah, Megalodon <laughs> and all, right? Yeah. So right. I want to jump on something here. We've got about probably 10 minutes left here, but let's go ahead because there's a lot of concern about the Chinese CCP and what we've been talking about here. How do we see that whole thing playing out? Because I'm getting a feeling that that's not only weakening, but it's probably on the verge of maybe even being defeated. Uh, the, the CCP being defeated itself? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, we're going to have to see on that one. Um, I'm with you, and when I say we're going to have to see, it's really my own ignorance working here. So, uh, the but specifically, I I think more there is the more populous uprising you're seeing around the world, the less influence the CCP seems to have. Uh, this is clearly going on in India right now. Indian. Is, wants very little to do with CCP and, and is pushing back against them. Um, the, you've seen some strange things going on in Europe because uh, the bullies in Brussels were so incompetent uh, with the, uh, the vaccine rollout or just not even that, just masks and, and all the sort of stuff that people were being uh, forced into over the last several months that you did start seeing uh, like Italy and and Hungary going to China for for support. So there's some little pockets of of, uh, reprieve in in that trend. But it seems to me the trend that is emerging is that the more populous we become, the more we push back on CCP influence, which is a good thing. The opposite is also true. The more globalist we become, the more CCP uh, ends up influencing and infiltrating. There's just really no way around. That's just the nature of globalism. And it seems like Western globalism, you know, you hear, you hear Daniel, the, the, those excuses from people like Mark Cuban and all, well, if we don't cooperate with them, they're just going to, you know, pirate our stuff and, you know, they're just going to do their own version of it. So we might as well give them the technologies and the like, but make sure we get some money uh, in return. Yeah, so they're just doing it for their own enrichment and their own their own benefit. Again, it's the permanent political class, in this case, the corporate uh, oligarchs who are just ruling in accordance with their own values and interests and and benefit. And it's always at the expense of the middle class and the you know the industrial worker and the like. And the bottom line, as I said, even in the beginning of the around the beginning of the show, is if you follow the money, you understand why people say what they say and do what they do. Mark Cuban, he's a billionaire. Of course, he's going to say these things. Right. Now back to uh, when you were talking about the EU. What about what's going on with Macron of France? <laughs> yeah, what is going on with this guy? I can't figure him out. <laughs> One minute he's the emperor of Europe, and the next minute he's trying to expel Islam from his nation. You know, kind of yeah. like, what's going on here, dude? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is fascinating. It is uh, his his um, transformation, and then then taking several steps back, but. Bottom line, Macron was act- he ran ironically as a populist. He ran as a uh, center-left populist. Uh, France has basically um, turned their backs on their two main parties, the Socialists and, and the Republicans, and they are now going to these um, third parties. Uh, so on the left, it's En Marche, which is which is Macron's uh, party, his own party that he started. So it's very very young. And uh, National Rally, which was National Front for many years, but it's only still only a few decades old. That's going to be the Nationalist Populist Party headed by Marine Le Pen. So um, basically, you have to imagine imagine a MAGA party and a Bernie Sanders party or something. Well, that's not good because um, Macron is a little too globalist for Bernie Sanders. But you, you kind of get the point there. Sure. It's it just two third parties took over, and you're seeing that happening in Europe a lot. That's why I think. You know, don't discount the emergence of a new, you know, Patriot Party. It, it could happen. So anyway, um, he uh, got he got uh, beaten up immediately because everyone saw he really is just a banker and he really is just he he buys into the globalist structure and he's trying to make France more globalist. France, ironically, has been very resistant towards that. You know, with their their strong unions and and the like. The uh, yeah the yellow vest uprising explode when uh, Macron was trying to impose this you know the Green New Deal their own kind of Green New Deal on on the French and it was and they should have what he was doing was horrific the the, the rich were were getting off 
um, on on taxes, and he was slapping a fuel consumption tax on the middle class and the worker who had to. Oh, oftentimes they would have to commute an hour into Paris because there was no jobs in the rural areas where they were working. But things because of the gentrification of Paris, with the globalist class out there, uh, they couldn't afford to live where there were jobs. So they would have to they would have to commute. And then Macron said, "Good, you're going to help the environment by me doubling how much it costs you to 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 put some gas in your car." And they blew up the so the, you had the yellow vest uprising. You have. Uh, you have Marine Le Pen just uh, skyrocketing in the polls. Then you have the whole COVID mismanagement. And, um, and, but then, interestingly enough, then you had a, a series of uh, radical Islamic uh, violence in France. And boy, did Macron crack down. So much so, even you know, Merkel and, and the bullies in Brussels said, oh, my heavens, what are you doing? You're not allowed to do that. And uh, and uh, and you know, Macron said, "Forget it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, France is for the French, and the French. Well, he would say are a secular people. Their their version of secularism is uh, ironically actually a very kind of spiritual nationalism. It's pretty interesting. And uh, so, if you're Islamic and and you, you don't want to be a part of this, then you're out. You know, you're gone. And so." He and many thought he needed to do that in order to thwart the rise of Le Pen on the right, who has no problem uh, saying that many um, mosques need to be closed down and imams deported and the like. So right now he's a mess. I mean, it's really hard to pin him down where he is. Uh, he is behind Le Pen in all the polls. We'll have to see what happens uh, in 2022. That's when they have their next presidential election. They're every five years. So. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Ma- Macron is probably the most fascinating guy right now. For for a while, all I did was mock him, and then and then when he started cracking down on the uh, on the radical Islam there on the mosques, I said, "Whoa, wait a minute now! If if we're seeing if we're seeing the globalist champion par excellence actually sounding like Trump." Something's going on here. So, but then again, then he starts bungling all these other things. So we're gonna have to see what happens with Macron. Yeah, exactly. Well, with a couple of minutes left, I thought I'd focus uh, real briefly on one of your newest postings here, which is Bank of America. Oh well, yeah. I'll tell you, the founder of Bank of America, if he was alive today, he'd be rolling over his grave and he'd probably shut them all down. <laughs> right, right. Same with same with Walmart or yeah, McDonald's exactly. or Ray Kroc. Yeah, they were all they were all good nationalist, you know, American guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know the funny thing about Bank of America was uh, actually founded by an Italian immigrant, and he was actually going out and giving loans to the small guys. Wow. And, you know, that's how he started. Then it was because, and that was on the West Coast as we were actually migrating out to the West. But then it was the Eastern bankers that were coming in, and they were you know kind of infiltrating over time, but he was one of those, you might say, what do they call that movement now where people do micro loans? They can do them in between each other. He was kind of like, I would say, almost the original idea behind that. Ah, okay. And anyway, but let's talk about your newest uh, tag here, your newest episode on what Bank of America is doing now. Yeah, yeah, well, so the latest video, boy, you, you must get, my editor just must have put that up for you. That's great. That's uh, probably in the last hour or so, but yeah, Bank of Mary, and this is, uh, kudos to Tucker Carlson. He's the one who really broke the story, uh, but he uh, found out uh, that Bank of America has, without the knowledge or the uh, consent of its customers, have been sharing uh, private information with federal law enforcement agencies, the FBI. Oh, boy. Yeah, and this is after January 6th riot at the Capitol. Um, they're using that as an excuse for anything and everything. And uh, Bank of America went through its own customers' financial and transa- transaction records. So according to Tucker, uh, they're basically functioning more or less as, uh, as an intelligence agency. And, uh, and again, this is, these are not people who have been accused of anything or anything like that. This is just... You know, this is just good old-fashioned surveillance. <laughs> go, good old let's Patriot go. Act stuff. <laughs> yeah, you got it. You yeah. got it. And and when Bank of America was confronted by it, of course, again, this is all the report of Tucker Carlson um, that was last night. When they were confronted by it, they said, yep, that's, uh, that's true. We were doing that, and we believe that's our responsibility to work together with the uh, with uh, federal law enforcement. And, of course, Tucker said, uh, actually, that's not true. Uh, the lawyers that we've consulted 
um, claim that what you're doing, Bank of America is doing, may in fact be illegal and could be challenged in court. And I just basically made the argument here. I, I uh, contrasted that with what happened to a YouTuber named Amanda, Amanda Ensing. She's a fashion uh, YouTuber, very conservative Christian girl, big-time Trump supporter. And she was dropped by uh, a major uh, you know, company, corporation that was uh, endorsing her called Sephora. And, um, you know, because Sephora said that she, uh, she is not uh, compatible with our value of inclusion. <laughs> wow. So, so in, in this kind of, you know, in, in this bizarre sort of 1984 sense, therefore we're going to exclude you, you know. Uh, and so she decided, said, all right, fine, I'm going to launch my own makeup line. And it's called, you guessed it, Make Makeup Great Again. And wow. I said, you know, again, it's kind of a rocky thing. I said in the video, you know, we really have to talk more about creating parallel structures or what uh, the uh, Soviet dissidents, uh, Václav Havel, Václav Benda, called uh, parallel polys. And that's going to involve, you know, uh, creating our own banks. It's going to create our own, you know, credit cards, creating our own sort of post-Silicon, post-Google, post-Bank of America world. And the good news is it's actually already happening in many ways. Uh, oh, yeah. So, yeah, scholars call them frontier innovators. And these are, these are, these are entrepreneurial uh, activists outside of Silicon Valley and the L.A. and New York, London. So we're talking guys, you know, in Kenya to Kansas, Uganda to Utah, who are building up uh, alternative banks and, you know, alternative uh, industries to that of Silicon Valley and their business models and the like. And I'm, I'm just encouraging our listeners to say, you know what, it's already happening. There's wonderful things going on. So the more they debank us and the more they, you know, excommunicate us uh, from, from their world, well, guess what? We're going to take our money. We're going to build our own world. And it'll be all the better for us, and it'll all be all the worse for them. You know, and in uh, finishing this wonderful show, and I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to meet with you through the phone and talk about Rocky and all the good things that we've uh, enjoyed in this last hour, but you've really hit on a theme, and I'm glad that we finished up the way you just did because you have just said clearly this is why globalism or anything like it will never, ever, ever be sustainable, and there's this specific reason why. We are born through God, or whatever anybody wants to call this, and that image. And that image is simply this. We are co-creators. Yeah. And yeah. when somebody comes along and tries to say, well, this is how you're going to do it. Now, one of God's laws is, I'm going to give you the freedom of choice to figure out how to go ahead and express the right. inherent creativity that you have specifically to serve the world. Right. And when people come along and tell you, no, this is the way you're going to do it, I'm sorry, you're hardwired yep. to fight that. It's yep. just inevitable. Yeah. Oh, that's a great point, Daniel. Yeah, we're, we are. We are co-creators, and we love to build, and we love to create. And uh, when we're being basically told, uh, no, you're no longer allowed here. We don't want you here. But that's fine. We'll pick up. We've got <laughs> no we're, 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 our end, we've got frontiersmen's blood in our blood, you know. So no problem at all. We'll uh, to to the frontier we go, and we start building a post globalist society together. It's going to unify us like nothing before. It's going to be perfect for 2022, and uh, and I'm I'm really excited about the possibilities of what we can build together. Well, Steve, again, thank you for being on the program. Why don't you go ahead and shout out to the listeners where they can find you YouTube-wise, uh, you know, website-wise, and the like. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, you they bet. can go to my website. It's my last name, T-U-R-L-E-Y, Turley Talks, all one word like TEDTalks.com, or they can just punch in Dr. Steve Turley on YouTube or on Rumble and, um, and check us out on some videos there. And We've also got some really neat podcasts as well. I agree. I've been enjoying your stuff, like I said, since early summer last year. And boy, I'll tell you, it's just it's refreshing to sit here. The kind of positivism that you put out, but also you have a lot of uh, just great reasoning behind it. You know, and, uh, and so I encourage people to check that out as well. Steve, thank you for being on the program today. It's been a great pleasure.
Oh, thank you, Daniel. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you, you so much. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. You can discover more at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter and stay up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as our upcoming shows. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 radio program. And remember, wherever you are is where you should be. Have a great day.